Let's just pray. Father God, I pray today as we approach the word, God, that you would just bring your word. God, I pray in power and demonstration. Lord, we don't just speak words, Lord, of men. Lord, we come to hear your word. And God, I pray, Lord, every person that's here today, God, that you would fill us, God, Lord, with a revelation of Christ. And Lord, I pray that you would encourage the discouraged. God, heal the broken. And Lord, I pray those that are wounded, Lord, that you would restore them. And God, we ask you today, God, for Becky, Lord, there at Mayo Clinic today, and Lord, full of all the tubes and everything else and the battles that she's going through. But God, I pray that you raise this woman up. And God, I pray that you would do a mighty work of healing in her life. We give you thanks and we give you glory, God, in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said Amen. Praise God. I would encourage you next week too. I know I started last week if you're here to talk about Mark Renfro. He's not here today. He will be here next week. Uh, he is a missionary. He oversees all the missionaries for about 300 missionary families for the Middle East, which is the Muslim world, and for Israel. And uh, God is doing amazing things in the Middle East. He is not just a missionary. He is a great preacher. He will challenge you. So come and bring a friend, and we'll believe God to move in, in a great way next week. Take your Bibles. We're in John chapter 6. We're going through uh, the signs from heaven. Uh, just real quickly in John chapter 20, it says that there's many miracles that are written about in the scriptures. Uh, but, it, but it says this, but the ones that are written in the book of John, those seven miracles or signs that are given, are given for us that we would believe and that by believing that we would know the power of his name. And what a great passage. And it's, it's the heart of God. It's the heart of the Holy Spirit. Jesus wants his church to walk in power and authority, to know him. Listen, we are not to be overcome. We are overcomers. And if your Christian experience is one of, you know, uh, walking and, and being depressed or broken and no victory and no joy, I want to say to you, no, there's certainly nobody is against you at all. God loves you. And I, I understand that there's physical battles that people go through. I'm certainly not uh, making any statements that way. But I'm here to say God means for you to walk in a powerful, victorious way. Jesus gave his life, not so that we would, you know, just kind of make it until he comes back he wants us to walk in victory and authority amen and so John says that these seven signs that the seven miracles that he writes in his book are written for the church now we are today we're going to be talking about the sixth sign but let me just go through uh, quickly uh, for for just to for refresher for some of you the first sign was the, uh, was the wedding of Cana, and it was representative of the new birth, uh, being full of the Holy Spirit. The second one was the nobleman's son, uh, which was uh, by faith believing God's word, that if God says it, uh, then I believe it, and that settles it, amen? <laughs> and that's why it's important to know the Bible. Uh, that's imp why it's important to know God's word, because once you know God's word, then you walk his word out. The third sign was, uh, was the lame man that Jesus told him to take up his mat and walk. And you, when you look in the scriptures, just the opposite of the, no the nobleman was full of faith. The man that rolled up his bed didn't know who Jesus was. He had no faith and it was completely an act of grace. So we see that covenant of grace. And then Jesus comes back to him in, in, at the end and says, listen, if you keep on sinning, uh, these things will come back. So he, he gives a word to them, uh, to this man after he heals them, that he needs to walk in, in the victory that the Lord has given to him. The fourth sign was last week, I preached about this, was the feeding of the 5,000. It was the loaves and the fishes. And it's a message of stewardship, giving to God out of a pure heart and then serving God. And we, we saw at the end of this uh, great story that there was 12 baskets full. And I know that there's some of us that are here today and you serve God and you pour your life out for Christ and the gospel and you're busy serving. And sometimes you think, wow, I've just given everything that I have to give. I wanna tell you, at the end of them serving the 5,000, what was it? 12 baskets that were left. How many disciples serving were there? 12. And I want to tell you, there's a provision of heaven as you give, as you serve, as you go, that God wants to provide uh, for you manna from heaven to continue on in the battle. Now, Friday, uh, Wednesday night, uh, Pastor Neil was here, and he talked about the, the, uh, the, the fifth sign, which I want to just very briefly talk to you about uh, before I get into the, the message today. And that, that fifth sign was overcoming the storms. It was Jesus walking on water. And just very quickly, 
in Mark 6 and 52, you can actually hold your uh, finger there in John chapter uh, 6, but it says in 6 and 52, the same story in another gospel, but it says, uh, then he climbed into the boat and the wind stopped. And they were totally amazed, for they didn't understand, and I want you to see this, they didn't understand the significance of the miracle of the loaves. And their hearts were too hard to take it in. So they had a hard heart of unbelief. And in their hardness of heart, they didn't realize what the, the miracles of the loaves and the fishes. And if you go to, uh, to chapter 6 of John, you see that the storm is lodged right between the feeding of the 5,000 and then the scriptures that follow. So right in the middle of the story, and here's what it says, that they were afraid because they didn't consider the great miracle that they had seen with the loaves and the fishes. And folks, what is that speaking to us? And Pastor Neil gave a great story. He, he went back to a David Wilkerson message. If you can get the CD, I think that you would uh, really be blessed. But the message was this. Uh, listen, they had the right song, but they were on the wrong side. And he goes back to the children of Israel when they're at the Red Sea. And they're coming up to the Red Sea, and Pharaoh's army is behind them. And they're coming, and they're trapped. And what they begin to do is they begin to complain against Moses and God, why did you bring us here to die? And they, they become very angry in their hearts. But Moses looks at them and he says, hey, stand still, be quiet and stand still. How many of us that sometimes we just need to stand still and be quiet and trust God? And he says, just trust God because today you will see his salvation. And what happened? The, the waters part, they walk on the dry land. They come to the other side, and God destroys the power of Pharaoh and his armies and his chariots. And then they get to the other side of the river, and what happens? It says that they begin to glorify God. What a great God we serve. Hallelujah, he is wonderful and awesome. And some of you used to sing the old uh, charismatic song, and the horse and the rider is thrown into the sea. Anybody remember those, those songs? And they have a great shout of victory on the other side of, of the lake or of the Red Sea, and here's my thing to you, and this is what I believe that Jesus was speaking in the fifth sign, that listen, God doesn't just want us to praise him after the miracle happens, after the provision happens. If you understood the miracles of the loaves and the fishes, you know that God is my supplier. You know that God doesn't add, he multiplies, and he cares for us, and he loves us. And here is the incredible news, that if we can learn to praise God and get the right song, but get it on the other side of the river, they could have praised God on, 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 on one side of the lake, and as they walked through the lake, and when they got to the other side of the lake, and the disciples, because of the hardness of their heart, they're out rowing and fighting the storm. When God is just saying, can you rest in my provision? I will care for you. And by the way, I said that you would be to the other side of the lake. And if I tell you, you'll be to the other side of the lake. How do you know you're getting to the other side of the lake? And listen, every one of us has, have a promise for God. We may go through trials. We may go through difficulties. We may go through hardships. But listen, God is bringing us to the other side of the lake. And my life is in his hands. Amen? And so it's a, a great testimony. So get the right song, but get it on the right side of the lake and then let it continue on. The storms of life will come. But I want to tell you, Jesus walks on water and Peter begins to walk on the water. What happens when he begins to fall? He reaches out and Jesus takes his hand. And I want to tell you, when it seems like you're sinking or failing or falling and you, you go, God, what, I'm, what am I going to do? You reach up and Jesus wants to take a hold of your hand. Isn't that a good message? Praise God. Can we just give God the glory because he is the God of the storms. Now, going in today, I want us to go to John chapter 9. This is the sixth miracle. And I believe that the message today is about standing as a righteous testimony. I'll tell you this. Some of you have heard this part of my testimony before, but we were in Ireland and we had a situation with Chris's dad that we had to come home. We didn't have a choice in the matter. Every time in my life and ministry, the Lord has spoken to me precisely about the next place that I'm to go. And it's never been a question. The Lord has spoken. When I went to Ireland, it was as clear as day before we went on the mission field. The only time that that didn't happen 
is in the situation with her father. And I was happy. We were serving God. We are doing missions work. I love Ireland. I still love Ireland. You know by all the Irish people we have coming through, I love Irish people. Amen. Owen, uh, <laughs> here's my proof. Owen and Sarah love them dearly. I love Irish people. So we were happy. We were content. And Chris's dad falls ill. So we did not have, the only option that we had was to stay there and to put him into a nursing home when we could be caring for him. And he lives with us now. And my wife is the most awesome lady in the world. And she cares for him. And she's the, uh, she looks after two teenagers and one big baby. No, I'm just joking. Uh, I'm pro- probably three teenagers at times. Uh, but she, uh, and, and then she's the pastor's wife. I thank God for her. But listen, there was a moment there that I didn't know. God, you know, uh, you have to give me something. And so I was praying one day. You know, sometimes when you're, when you're sitting there praying and you're going, God, speak to me, is when he never speaks. That, can anybody say amen to that? And then when you're just going about your business, I'm mowing the grass. They have grass and it grows in Ireland. And I'm mowing the grass and the Lord speaks. Like to this day, I've, I've said this, I've given this testimony a hundred times. But the Lord spoke to me and he said this. You're to go back home and you're to stand as a righteous testimony. Now, that's very vague. And for years, I've looked at it, and I've gone, okay. And I came back. Now, once I got back over here, I don't have a job. I don't have insurance. I don't know what I'm doing. And I'm coming back to America, and we're on the plane. Uh, Krista could tell you the story. We're like, what are we going to do? We don't know. Uh, but the Lord has provided for us, and he eventually called us to start this church. But my point to you is this is that he said, I've called you to stand as a righteous testimony. I've always felt like that that is incredibly vague until I read the story today. When I go through the story today, the Lord has spoken to me in incredible ways. What does it mean to stand as a righteous testimony? So number six today in the signs, we have born again by grace, by faith, uh, stewardship, walking through the storms. All of those are part of our spiritual life. But God has called us to stand as a righteous testimony. So start with me in chapter 9. The first question that we're going to uh, deal with today is generational curses. And in chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, it says this. As Jesus is walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Uh, Rabbi, his disciples asked him, uh, uh, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? Now, Here's a couple things that I want you to see. Jesus walks along and he sees the blind man. Now, we know today that the blind man couldn't see him, but he could see the blind man. Now, you may be here today and there's a spiritual sight and there's a physical sight, but you may be here today and maybe your eyes, when it comes to the gospel and who God is, maybe you have eyes of unbelief and you go, I don't really see Jesus today, but I want to tell you, you can't see him, but he sees you. You may not believe in him, but he's looking at you. He's looking at the situation. And this, this blind beggar, think of his life. He was the beggar that sat by the, the street. He was, uh, because of the Jewish religion and what they believed at the time, people believed that he was born under a curse, that the reason he was blind was either because of his sin or the sins of his parents. They treated him that way. He's sitting on the side of the road. He's blind. He has no power to overcome in his life. His education level would have been very low. Uh, his ability to, uh, to, to think and work in that day and time would have been, uh, would have been very marginal. But Jesus saw the blind man and they come up to him and the disciples say, Rabbi, tell us, is it this man or is it his parents that have committed sin? Now, I want you to see it's the legalistic point of looking at mankind. Everything is a personal sin. Now, I do believe that we have the effects of a fallen nature. And I do believe as well in a fallen world, but we also have sin. There are times that your sin can cause sickness. If you uh, are an alcoholic for years, you can have liver disease. If you smoke cigarettes your whole life, you can have lung disease. So there are decisions that we make that can have effects upon us. And, uh, but in all of the scripture, with all of the people that Jesus healed, it's only one time that sin is directly attributed to the person's sickness. So sickness is not always the result 
of sin. And here they go to a question that's even a question today. And I know today that there are some of you that have been through churches that talk about generational curses and, you know, sit down and go through the history and tell me what grandma and great-grandma and great-grandfather and what's all the sins and we need to break the curse and, and then, you know, figure out what the issues is so you can have a victory. Now, I want you to go with me back to Jeremiah. And I want to just tell you, I think that one of the questions that we're going to answer here today, uh, Jeremiah 31, is about generational curses. It was the idea at the time, because both in Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy, there are scriptures that say this, where God looks at people and he says, if you sin, if you don't keep my commandments, if you walk away from God, that you will be cursed to the third and to the fourth generation. Now understand this. If you say, well, that sounds a bit harsh, or what was the understanding of God? But there was no power against sin. Even when you go to places in the Old Testament, the people were killed, and God asked the children of Israel to kill people. And you go, why would God do that? Well, the reason was because the only way that they had to fight sin was, was, uh, was through either killing it, knocking it off, staying away from it. And so there was a warning to parents that, listen, if you sin, the, you need to know that if you are not faithful to me, that there will be a curse that goes to the third and the fourth generation. Now, I want you to see this. It is old covenant. And there's people who go back to these places. And there may be some of you here that have gone through teachings with this. And I'm just going to ask you to do this today. Just sit back and relax. <laughs> And hear what I'm saying today. Some of you maybe have not struggled with this at all. Maybe some of you have gone through teachings this way. And, you know, we need to break the generational curses. I, I, I saw a message, probably one of the largest churches uh, from Orlando to Jacksonville. Uh, the, and the pastor wrote last week, I won't say the name, but he said, last week we, we broke every generational curse in the church. And first of all, I don't agree with that. If there is a generational curse that's broken, you certainly can't break it. If Jesus doesn't break it, it can't be broken. And, but I want to bring a little bit of understanding because it was an old covenant. But go with me to Jeremiah 31. And it says this, starting in verse 29. It says, the people will no longer quote this proverb. So this teaching came from what was in the law. The parents have eaten sour grapes but their children's mouths will be puckered from the taste. So has anybody ever eaten a sour grape? It's kind of gross. And it gets in your mouth and you're like, oh my goodness. So this is, what it, this is what the proverb was, that if you eat a sour grape, the one who's going to pay the price is your children. They're going to be the ones that are like, oh my goodness, the sour grape. Your sin will be passed along to your children. Sometimes we use something that's a little bit closer to that. Have any, anybody ever heard that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree? Yeah, well, you know, that's the way his daddy was, that's the way he is. That's the way mama was, that's the way he is. And it's been now uh, passed along. I want to tell you, I do believe that because of patterns of way that people live and struggles that people have, we certainly, in our DNA and our makeup, things can be passed along, temptations. We all have battles, uh, but the fact that it's a curse from God is a little bit different. And it says this, that all people will die for their own sins. Those who eat the sour grapes will be the ones whose mouths will pucker. The day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. So I want you to see this is very clear. In Ezekiel chapter 18, it goes back and says the exact same thing. So two different times it says, listen, no longer let it be said in Israel that the children will pay for the sins of the, the adults. Uh, and, and he says now when he finishes that, he says there'll be a new covenant that we won't live under the old covenant. And under the new covenant, Jesus Christ will break every curse and every power power of the enemy. This is the covenant. It's not like the one that I made with the ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They broke the covenant, uh, though I love them as a husband loves his wife. So he says, I love them, but they broke covenant. But this is the new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel on that day. Tonight, if you want to know more about that, come, come here tonight and we'll talk about that. But what he's saying is that there's a new covenant. And under the new covenant, People pay for their own sins. You don't pay for the, uh, the sins of your fathers or forefathers. Uh, he says, let it no longer be said in Israel. Now, when you come to John chapter 9, the thinking of the day was still very much that there would be, there would be people who went back and forth and debated on this issue. So some people would say, no, it's the sins of the child. 
because of what it says in Jeremiah and, uh, and Ezekiel. Other people would go back to law, and they would say, no, the law says to the third and the fourth generation. So when the disciples come, they're asking a question that the religion is asking of the day. And they're saying, listen, some people say it's a generational curse. Other people say it's because of their own sin. Why is this man blind? And I want you to see uh, Jesus, and we'll see there'll be... Uh, There'll, there'll be even more full answers as we go through the story. But I want you to see Jesus' response. He looks at them and he says this. It was not because of, this, of his sins or the parents' sins. It had nothing to do with any personal sin. I believe it had to do more with a fallen nature. And we'll see why in just a moment. But I just want to say this to some of you that are here today. I know that there's parents that sometimes go through guilt. You know, maybe I didn't do this right with my kids or that right with my kids. Maybe you've had children that are born uh, that have had handicaps or different things. And I have found parents over the years that tend to blame themselves. And I want to say, I want to say to you today, in the name of Jesus, let the guilt go. These parents had to be going through life, going, it was it something we did? God, are you angry at me? And I don't believe that it was any of that. He's looking at the situation and he says, listen, this situation doesn't have to do with anybody's personal sin. I believe it was about a sin that is uh, a part of a fallen world. And he goes on to say this. And could I just say this before I go on? There is no major denomination. The Assemblies of God makes a statement against generational curses. Um, the Baptists make statements against it. The Methodists, every major denomination, nobody that I know agrees with generational curses. There's not one theologian that I know that is a legitimate theologian. There are pastors of large churches that believe and propagate that, but no one that I know that knows the Greek and the Hebrew that goes in and studies theology believes in generational curses. You're certain welcome to. I won't, you know, I don't make it a point of fighting, but listen, rather than going back through what every parent and grandparent and great-grandparent and what they did to find a freedom to your issues, I believe that we'll find in the scriptures today that there's a greater way to find freedom to your issues than going back through what your parents and forefathers did. Uh, God wants to do a miracle, and he certainly, listen, if you want to know the truth, we're all under a curse if you're not a believer. If you don't know Jesus, we have a curse, and it's Adam's curse, and it was the curse of unbelief, and I believe that that same curse is still on everyone that's an unbeliever. Believer. But when you come to Christ, it says in Galatians 3.13 that he was crucified on the tree. He became a curse for you so that he would break every curse, everything against you, the power of death, hell, and the grave. And so today, I want you to have a joy in your heart that I'm not living under a curse from the past. Listen, I have to live a life of faith. And when you believe that and you walk in that, you'll see in this story that Jesus will be, bring a freedom. Can you say amen to that? Praise God. And if you struggle with this, come and talk to me. I'm happy to talk to anybody about the issues there. But here's what it says. He sa Jesus says that this happened so the power of God could be seen in him. Now, look at the way. So why did this happen? Because I want to reveal my power in this man. And it's seen in him, revealed in him. And I want you to see this today. God wants his power revealed in your life. He wants the world. It doesn't matter for this blind man, but every one of us, he wants to see the power of God living and alive in everyone that knows him. He wants that to be seen in you. Amen. Uh, Owen knows uh, a young man that was in Ireland. He's in a wheelchair. He's paralyzed. Um, gone through a life of difficulty. We've, certainly many people have prayed for him. They've taken him everywhere for people to pray for him. And he's in a wheelchair. But I'll tell you this. There's nobody on this planet that has inspired me more than that young man. He makes CDs. He loves Jesus with all of his heart. I remember one time I went to the hospital, and he had fluid that was coming around his heart, and the doctors were giving him, more, you know, just minutes to live. And I, he's got an oxygen mask, and they would put it on and, and would take it off at times. And every gasp of air that that young man had, he would, he would just sing songs to Jesus and, that, and I want to tell you, there's a lot of things that's moved my heart. There's nothing in this life that have moved my heart more than to see a guy at the time he was about 17 or 18 years old declaring the goodness and the wonder of Jesus. And God, my life is in your hands no matter what happens here. Now listen, I certainly believe in healing. I thank God for healing. Uh, I, years ago, I lived in Kentucky. We had a man that came to our church that had a seen eye dog. 
And there was about five of us that gathered around and prayed for, pray for him. And he was blind. Not, this wasn't any, you know, trick, you know, miracle, you know, sleight of hands. We prayed for the man. The man was healed. His eyes were open. He did his own Jericho march around the building about seven times. I mean, he was, his eyes were open right in front of me. And about a week later, he took his seeing eye dog. He said, you know, somebody else needs this. I don't need it anymore. Folks, Jesus opens blind eyes, and he does miracles, and I have no problem believing that. <laughs> Amen. We have miracles that are setting in this room. God has done miracles for me, and to figure out why some and not others, I don't know, but I'll tell you this. I've been to a lot of churches, been to a lot of places, and I've never been anywhere that everybody gets healed, and nobody goes through struggles, and sometimes we propagate that out to people, and it leaves them at a place of, of being diminished. But last week, we talked about in the feeding of the 5,000s, God, if I get my miracle, I praise you. If I don't get my miracle, I praise you. My praising you is not moved or changed, whether I get the miracle or not, because you are God, and you are worthy of my praise. Can you say amen to that? Jesus, God is good. So he, he looks at this and he says that I want the power of God to be revealed or seen in this man. And he says we must quickly carry out the task assigned by the one who sent us. And I want you to see this today. This is for you and for me. I don't believe that he's just talking about this man. If you would, look at this man as a type of blindness that every one of us were born with spiritual blindness. We're all blind. And Jesus will come and open our eyes physically and spiritually, and he's, he's saying this, that we must carry out the task that God has assigned uh, by the one who has sent us. And I want to ask you this before I go on in this message. What has God called you to do? What are you on this planet for? If it's all about you and your happiness and your success and how good things go for you, if that is what this world is all about, you will be very miserable. But I'm saying to you, God has given you a gift, a talent, a mission, a purpose, and whatever that is, Jesus is saying, listen, this man has a purpose, and we need to work quickly to fulfill the purposes that God has in our life. And he, then he, he goes on and he says, the night is coming that no one can work, uh, but while I am here in this world, I am the light of the world. Jesus died, you will die, a tribulation will come, and listen, there'll be a time that you can't work anymore. There's a time you can't witness anymore. There's a time you can't talk to loved ones anymore. And folks, I'm here to say to you in the name of Jesus, while the day is here, while God has a mission and a plan for your life, fulfill it. Carry it out. Don't walk through this life having not fulfilled the things that God has called you to fulfill. There's a purpose for you. Then Jesus very interestingly does this. It says, then he spits on the ground made with mud with saliva. Now, I'm just telling you, back then, that may have been normal. But in the neighborhood I lived in, if somebody would have, you know, spit on the ground, make a little mud ball, and stick it in my eyes, we're fighting, okay? Amen? But let me tell you something. Jesus can spit on me anytime he wants, right? <laughs> so, so is, now, saliva spit in these days had, they, they felt like that it had medicinal purposes, so that was, in their day, that would have been one of the medicines that they would use. How are you glad for modern technology? <laughs> okay, you go to the doctor, he's like, yeah, I think I know the answer to that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but look at it a little bit deeper. You have Jesus, and he's spitting into the ground. What is he spitting on? To the dirt. If you go back to Adam and look in this just for a moment, the first time that God created man, what did he do? He took from the dust of the ground and he breathed into it and man became a living soul. Why? Because Jesus could have instantly healed him at the moment. Why did he have to do it this way? He spits into the ground, into the dirt, into the dust. He places it in the man's eyes. He covers the man's eyes. So look at it, if you would, in this way. He, he's taking this, this mud and he is about to completely give him two brand new eyes. Now, with all the technology that we have today, you know what? Nobody can give you brand new eyes. They can change the color of your eyes. You can go to a doctor, and he can change the color of your eyes. But with everything that we have, we do not have the ability today to give two new eyes. Do you know how complex an eye is? They can do prosthesis. They can do other things. But an eye, with all of our technology, we're unable to do this. But what does Jesus do? If you would look at this in, in a way of he came and created Adam the first time, but now he's bringing new life to open the eyes of man. He takes the dirt. 
He takes his saliva. Now he puts it onto the eyes. And you know what will happen is that by the end of this story, God takes two brand new eyes and puts it into his eye sockets. How many of you believe that he had 20-20 eyesight? I bet that guy could see a, a squirrel from five miles away, for all you guys that are hunting uh, about this time. He had incredible eyes, eyes from heaven. So he spits on the ground with the mud. He makes saliva, and he spreads the mud over the blind man's eyes, and he tells him, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Uh, the, now, look at this. Siloam means sin. So the man went, and he washed and came back seeing. I want you to see this as a picture of a baptism. And he's going to a place where he's sent. Now, why are we baptized? Last week, we had about 27 people baptized. And one of the people gave a testimony and said that baptism is an outward uh, display of an inward work. There's an inward change, an outward display. And what is the outward display? We are telling the whole world that my life has been changed. And now I stand as a witness, as a righteous testimony. Now, you have this man. His eyes are covered with mud. He never sees Jesus. Now, I want you to notice as well. He never asked Jesus to heal him. Jesus takes this, puts it into his eyes, and the man goes away with his eyes full of mud. He goes to the pool, and he washes himself. If you would look at that as a picture of baptism, now he's standing as a righteous witness. Look what happens immediately to this place called sin. He's sent with a purpose. He's going there. Uh, he went there by faith, by the way, if I would say this, because it was a very far track from where they were at to where the pool of Siloam uh, would be at, and it's, I've been to the Pool of Sloan, myself and Krista, and it's a very windy place to get there. And so he, here he's blind with mud in his eyes. I believe that his eyes were already healed. But he's walking through this place by faith because Jesus didn't even say that he would be healed. He, Jesus just put mud in his eyes and told him to go and wash his eyes out. So now when he washes them out, now he can see. Now look in verse 8. His neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked, each other, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? And some said uh, that he was, but then others said, no, it's just somebody that looks like him. Uh, but the beggar kept saying, yes, I am the one. And they asked, well, who healed you? What happened? And he told him, the man that they called Jesus made mud and he spread it into my eyes and he told me to come and wash in the pool of Siloam and, and wash yourself. And so I went and washed and now I can see, do you see the testimony? Hey, now his eyes are saying, people are going, we don't even know who you are. Now I want you to see at this point that we will go from a place of physical blindness to a place of spiritual blindness. We're going from a physical to a spiritual. Now he's coming to the place and he can see his eyes are open. And now they're looking and they're going, man, there's a change. What is different about it? He can see there's something that's different. And I want to say to you, when you come to know Jesus, there is something that changes about who you are. If the people at work don't see it, if the people at your home don't see it, if your children don't see it, if your wife doesn't see it, if the people in your neighborhood don't see it, I want to just suggest to you maybe something is a disconnect from what Jesus did into your life and now the way that you're living. Because listen, when you get this right, people notice a change in who you are. Man, when I got saved, I, I, immediately I had people at work, I had people that were friends of mine, like what is different, what is the matter, people that I wouldn't even say. I, I, I had a gym that I went to at the time, and I, I played college football, so I did a lot, a lot of weightlifting, and I had guys come up to me at the gym and go, what's different with you? And I'm going, what are you talking about? They're like, I don't know, there's just something really different about you. Uh, one guy said, you don't curse. You're not arrogant, which I used to be pretty arrogant. Uh, <laughs> they're like, you're kind, you're nice. What happened to you? And I, I remember standing there going, well, I asked Jesus to be my savior, and he changed my life, and he's turned everything around. And I want to tell you, when Jesus does a work in your life, God makes a difference in the way you live and behave, and now the neighbors are coming. And I want you to see that this sixth sign the sign to come and go, now God wants to make the change. He's sending you to a lost world. You're living by faith. There's been a new birth. You're living by the grace of God. Uh, you, you've learned to be a steward. And now God is bringing you to a place. You survived the storms of life. And now he's saying, I am sending you to, as a witness to a lost world. Now, Jesus keeps doing this. He did it in the second miracle. And now he's doing it again. What do they say uh, in verse 13? Uh, now they took a look at the man who had been blind, uh, and they took him to the Pharisees because it was on the Sabbath. Jesus, why are you healing these people on the Sabbath? 
he knows it's against the rules. Do you think when Jesus heals somebody on Sabbath and it's against the rules, do you think Jesus knows that it's against the rules? <laughs> I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of religion that is all about the rules. Jesus is about giving life. Uh, Gary Wilkerson, I heard him tell a story back some time ago, and he said there was a man that had a son, and he didn't have a job. He wanted a car. He had long hair. And he says, listen, go get a job and cut your hair, and I'll buy you a car. So his son goes out, and he gets a job, and he comes back. And he says, Dad, I got a job. Will you buy me a car now? And he says, no, you didn't cut your hair. And the young boy looks at him, and he says, well, Jesus had short hair. And, uh, you know, why do I have to get my hair cut? And the man looked at him and says, yeah, and Jesus walked everywhere too. And so <laughs> I don't know which side I fall on. I, I, listen, it's not about the long hair. It's, 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 it's not about outward appearance. It's about what Jesus does on the inside. And now they're looking at him and they're saying, hey, you're not keeping our rules because it was on the Sabbath and that Jesus made the mud and he healed him. And then the Pharisees asked the man all about it. So he told him, he put mud over my eyes. When I've washed it away, I could see. Now I gave you a little bit more theological answer going back to the dust of the earth and so forth. You know, there's a real possibility. Jesus just wanted to mess with the Pharisees. I mean, he just wanted to like, here, explain this one, guys. And they kept going. They, they Actually, three times they go, so tell me again. We well, took spit he put it in the mud he stuck it in my eyes i washed the thing and now i can see and they're like well how do i what how, how do i put that in my book the four principles to getting free of uh, of blinded eyes how, how do you do that so here here they're in this place and I, I want you to see this he puts the mud over the eyes they, they don't understand they don't see some of the pharisees said this man jesus uh, is not from god for he is working on the sabbath he doesn't keep our rules so he must not be from god others said but how could an ordinary sinner do such miraculous signs and so there was a deep division uh, of opinion among them and then the pharisees questioned the man who had been blind and demanded what is your opinion about this man who healed you and the man says well i think he must be a prophet but the Jews still refused to believe the man had been blind, and that now he could see, and they called his parents. So anyways, they call in the parents, and the parents say, well, he can answer for himself. Go down with me to verse, I guess it's about 23. It says Jesus, uh, uh, he, he announced uh, everyone saying that Jesus was the Messiah. I'm, I'm sorry, go, go to verse 22. His parents said this because they were afraid that the, of the Jewish leaders who had announced that anyone saying that Jesus was Messiah would be expelled from their synagogue. And that's why they said that he is old enough, ask him. So now what are the parents afraid that if they endorse Jesus, they're going to be put out of the synagogues? Listen, this is what religious people do. Religious people try to control and manipulate. And how do they do it? With their power. Hey, if you mess with us, we'll put you out of the synagogue. We'll reject you. But uh, th these people had to take a stand. So for the second time, they called in the man who had been blind and told him, uh, God, uh, God should get the glory for this because we know that this man, uh, Jesus, is a sinner. And verse 25, I love this. The man says, I don't know whether he is a sinner, but the man replied, but I know this. I was blind, and now I can see. <laughs> it doesn't that finish all the arguments. <laughs> I, I don't know if he was good, bad, but I'm telling you, I was blind, and now I see. And you see something, and this is the point that I want to make to you as you go through this story. They're accusing him. They're fighting with him. They're trying to cause doubt in him. But what happens is this, is that when your eyes have been opened to Jesus, when you see who Jesus is, all of the questions, all of the fighting, all of the doubts, did it drive this man to unbelief? No. It brought him to a place, he's saying, he is a prophet. And if you go through the story, one place after another, he's, he's going, he is a prophet. And listen, he opened my eyes. So if you say, I, he is from God, do you know what? And every step of the way, you see not only his physical eyes, but his spiritual eyes are being opened to Jesus. And then it says that after he says this in verse 28, it says, then they cursed him and said, you're a disciple, uh, but we, you're, you're his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know God spoke to Moses, but we don't even know where this man comes from. And I want you to see this. We don't have to go through this, but in the New Covenant class tonight, we'll talk about this. But it says, what blinds the eyes of men so that they can't see Jesus is law. Law blinds us from being able to see Jesus. If you can make it tonight, I think that you'll see this as clear as day. And now they're saying we're the disciples of Moses. But do you remember in the second miracle or sign, 
what, did, what they said, we have Moses as our father. And Jesus says, listen, I didn't come to condemn you. Moses, the one that you put your trust in, that law will condemn you because if you're guilty in one point, you're guilty of all points. I've come to save you from Moses and his law. I've come to give a new covenant, a new way, a new kingdom. And the way of your thinking is wrong. If you can see who I am, if you'll open your eyes and believe, and of course they don't. And, uh, and, and it says, then he responds back, why, that's very strange, the man replied. He healed my eyes, and yet you don't even know where he comes from? We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but he is ready to hear those who worship him and do his will. Ever since the world began, no one has been able to open the eyes of someone born blind. If this man were not from God, then he could not have done it. You were born a total sinner, they, they answered, and now you're trying to teach us, look at the pride Look at their response. Go down with me to verse 35. When Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man and he says, do you believe in the son of God? And the man answered, who is he, sir? I want to believe him. And then Jesus says, you have seen him. I'm standing in front of you and he's speaking to you. And he then says, yes, Lord, I believe. Now, here's my question to you and I'll close on this because really I think that this all comes down to, was it a generational curse was it his sin? He says, no, I want to show my glory. Hey, hey, listen, instead of trying to figure out what mom and dad did wrong and grandma and grandpa, he's saying this is what Jesus is saying. Will you just come to me and see who I am? If you want to look at your sins or your weaknesses or your difficulties or your battles, rather than trying to dig through your family tree and find out all the failures that you have and I'll break this and I'll break that, can you come to me and if you can see me, I will break every curse, every power of the enemy. Will you just come and see me and believe? Because if you can see me and believe, everything in your life will be broken. Now, my question to you today, church, is this. What is it that keeps you from seeing Jesus? Is it a hard heart of unbelief? Is it your love for religion or the law? Maybe you're here today, and what was so adequately said on Friday, maybe you're here and you're a man and you're still playing with all the toys Listen, maybe you need to rise up and be a man and get rid of some of those foolish ways. Maybe you're overcome with lust, whether it's for the opposite sex, and that's men or women. Maybe that's the lust for things. But listen, what happens is sin hardens the heart to unbelief. And when you come to a place and you go, hey, am I living a life that's fulfilled by God and fulfilling his purpose? And wherever he calls me to go, I go. And whatever he calls me to say, I say. And I'm living this abundant life that John chapter 20 is talking about. If you're not living that, what is keeping you from seeing the fullness of Jesus and his plan? And whatever that is today, I believe that God wants to take that unbelief. You don't have to sit down and figure out where it came. Listen, between myself and my wife, our parents have 13 divorces. You talk about a curse. Boy, if that was a curse, I'd be in trouble. My dad was a chain smoker 50 years, uh, and I don't smoke. Uh, we've dealt with depression in our family, adultery in my family and extended family. But I'm going to tell you what, in Jesus, I have one wife, and I love her, and she loves me. No adultery, no smoking, no depression. We love Jesus because Jesus breaks every chain. Amen. And the sixth sign today is this, that Jesus came to open blind eyes. If you're here today and this world has blinded you, your unbelief has blinded you, if there's anything that has blinded you from understanding the will and the purposes of God, I'm saying to you today, in the name of Jesus, let that die. And get a full picture of Jesus. This man stood in front of Jesus and he says, I'm looking at you. And I believe, and I believe that this man would have lived a very long life. You, you talk about testimony night at church. You know, come and tell us about how Jesus gave you two brand new eyeballs. You think the doctors weren't like looking at, let me inspect those eyes. 2020 eyesight. And here's a man standing as a testimony for the glory of God. They attacked him, they belittled him, they came against him, but this man says, no, I've seen Jesus, and when I see Jesus, I will never be the same again. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Worship team, come up. Let's just give God glory today. <laughs> Jesus, you're wonderful. Listen, I know we're a bit late. Just everybody stay where you're at. I want you to bow your heads. Close your eyes. I want to pray for a moment. Jesus, Lord, I believe you're in this place. Lord, I feel your presence here. 
And uh, Lord, we come into the weakness, the Lord, of who we are. But God, I pray today that we stand in the truth of your word. And Lord, I pray that the trumpet would give no uncertain sound. Lord, I pray today, God, that you would convince people that I can't convince, that you would show things that I have the inability to show and reveal today, Lord. God, I pray that we would see ourselves, Lord God. Lord, that there's a call. You're sending us just as he was sent to Saul. There's a mission to stand as a righteous testimony in the last days. God, I thank you, Lord, for the physical healings that you've done and God for the spiritual things. And Lord, I pray that you'd open our blind eyes. Lord, we look at the story and thank God for the physical healing. But God, we also look at the religious people that were blind to Jesus who's standing right in front of him and yet they couldn't find themselves to believe. I pray, God, in this place that you would open every eye in this place and lord i pray anything that's preventing us from seeing the fullness of your glory and your power and your anointing god i pray today that it would die so that we might see jesus you are the light of the world and god i thank you that you have put that light deep within us to stand as a testimony in these last days praise god right